Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We're going to talk about verbal behavior in this video. So what is verbal behavior? It is looking at language as behavior. Whenever we talk, it's still under the same theoretical framework as antecedent behavior consequence. This was a Skinner approach. He introduced verbal behavior, which focuses on the function of communication rather than its structure. Before he published that, a lot of people were focused on the structure. Did they say it correctly? Did they articulate it right? Did they have all the little pieces of the word together? Was there a space between words? All those things. And that's how they were teaching language to people who might not have developed language normally. Skinner brought this whole idea of verbal behavior looking at the function of the words instead of just the structure and the topography of the words. And so it's hugely maintained. A lot of the theories behind it is about how the environment changes the function of the language. So why are verbal operants important? Well, the first thing for you is you're going to be teaching a lot of language. That's a huge part of this job, kind of whatever setting you're working in. And so this is the sort of theories that you would operate under to teach language. It helps us understand why a person is communicating. It allows us to teach communication effectively based on function, and it improves the learner ability to communicate. And it's a big part of this is functional communication training to replace problem behavior. These are the types of operants you're going to learn. I think I talked about all of these. This is probably more than you might need for the RBT exam, but if you were to move on to other endeavors, you would need all of this. The first verbal operand, and this is always very rarely, it's like occasionally it's tax. So it's either tax or this, but the first baby's first word is most of the time man's. So you can think of it as a demand. It's controlled by motivating operations and reinforced by a specific consequence. For example, a child saying cookie when hungry and receiving a cookie in return. So whenever someone says something to gain something, it is a man. The word doesn't have to, they could just say cuh, and that's still a man. They could sign cookie, that's a man. They could make any kind of gesture that the caregiver knows is a cookie is considered a man. It doesn't have to be a perfect word. Most of the time, you know, both my kids, their first word was milk, which was for nursing. Most babies ask for some sort of milk or their formula because that's what they're eating when they start making gestures that mean words or trying to say words. A lot of times it's their first word. So anything that's a demand or a request for something. Teaching man's, these are the easiest to teach because all you do is withhold. <laughs> when we're teaching language, this is the first thing we start teaching if someone has very few words and we want to start teaching words. So, you know, instead of just handing them the cookie, you might withhold the cookie a little bit until they make a gesture or say a word. Then you give them the cookie. It's super reinforcing and it's the natural consequences. Like the natural consequences of asking, saying water is someone giving you water water. Uh, man's are a benefit to the speaker. Not all language benefits the speaker. So it's super important that this is the first step for teaching. Same with if you pull a PEX board, the first PEX are usually on an iPad and they're little icons that someone puts together to form sentences or say things. The first PEX you would teach is the things they need in their world. When they were thirsty, they hit the water one and then they get water. That's how we teach it. Same with sign language. There's reinforcement built in. We usually don't need to reinforce extra for a man's. They'll just reinforce themselves. If they ask for it, you have to give it to them. Even if, you know, it's not the right time or they had two cookies and they're saying cookie again. To start, you let them have it a lot to make sure it's clear in their head. When I say that, I get this. Tact is labeling. These are harder to teach, but they're typically the second type of language that people gain. It's just pointing to something. You don't have to point, but saying a label that they see at the time. 
So like you say tree when you see a tree, you're not going to get anything for saying tree when you see a tree. Someone might say dog, they might say chair, they might say television, they might say the names of family members like mama, dada, and their brothers and sisters' names. And so that's kind of the second level of language, but we call it the second operant, the second part of this. You do typically have to reinforce these because there's no reinforcement built in. You might use cards and if they label the cards correctly, you might give them a token board and they're earning tokens for labeling things correctly. It's always better to use the real thing than pictures. We like using pictures in ABA because it's a lot easier. You know, if you're teaching them like car, van, truck, going outside and finding a car, van, truck is hard, but that's better if they get to look at the actual, actual thing that they're labeling. This is expanding vocabulary. So it's vocabulary acquisition, and it's this major step in language development. It's how we start conversations. Being able to tact will start the ability to have a conversation, and it really supports our academic skills. Echoic is imitating. If one person says it and the other person repeats it, it needs to be exact for it to be an echoic. It helps build speech development, a necessary step to create more speech in people. The next thing we teach is this. You know, you want to provide immediate reinforcement. Once you get someone echoing you well, you can start tacting. They'll be tacting because they're saying the same thing. But we got to get that like mimic going so that you could teach them more words, more vocabulary and get them towards, you know, conversations. We do reinforce approximations, though it does have to be exact. If they say something else, it might not be an echo. It might be something else. Gradually shaped towards clearer speech. So interverbal is when we answer questions and con it's conversation. There's no visual or verbal prompt. It's only reinforced by social interaction. And these types of responsive enable conversation skills. So if you had the mans, the text, the echo, if you were there... Next, you might start with one word answers to questions like, do you like movies? Yes or no? If they say yes, that's an interverbal. Then you would build on that, like, what movie do you like? Have them say something that makes sense for that question. And this is, you know, helps with academic learning, social engagement. And again, with like typical children, this comes naturally. And we get to that interverbal level around age two, usually. Sometimes three, they start answering questions with more than just a word and we have actual conversations. Now, when language development is atypical, we have to do some intervention to get them to learn this stuff and use these skills. Sometimes language is at a level where we have to use alternative methods and that's fine. We might be using PECS, but we're still doing this or sign language. We're still going through these steps. So a verbal response that does not have a direct visual verbal prompt reinforced by social interaction. What's your name? And they say their name. That's usually the first one that we teach because it's important that if a person gets lost, they can express at least their name, maybe say a phone number or an address. And then you would say, that's right. Great job. And so you may give more reinforcement than praise. We do teaching strategies. We start with fill in the blank prompts that are known to them. It would be like twinkle, twinkle, little, and then they say star for, you know, if there's songs they really like or, you know, if their parents say something all this time, the same kind of thing, we might utilize those. And it kind of teaches them when someone ends with that question mark, which is sometimes hard for people to tell, but there's a way your voice goes when you end with a question mark that hey, you're supposed to respond to that with something else. So we have some other verbal operands, listener responding, textuals, and transcriptions. Listener responding is following instructions. Textual is reading written words out loud and re like reading cat from a book or reading. And like that comes in the later grades with typical development. Transcription is hearing words and writing. And there's even more after that. So essentially, this would be the stuff you would need for further education. It would not be on any of the exams for the behavior tech certs. It's good to kind of know about them and know that if you continue on, that's what's coming. And this, even though I only give you 
good information up to interverbal. No, I don't think you might work with listener responding. Like I did some reading stuff when I was working as a tech when I could do academic skills. A lot of times you're not allowed to do academic skills, but sometimes you are. You might work with these, but you'll receive like supervision and instruction and in how to do that. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you next lesson.